broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Shortly, I'm going to be handing you over to Deb and Margaret for our Our Place presentation. Before I start, I've just got a little bit of housekeeping to go through with everyone so we can make the webinar slightly more interactive and enjoyable. First things are, throughout the presentation, we're going to be pausing for polls. This is just so we can gauge how far you are in your journey with the Our Place process. We also encourage you to ask questions. Um, if you look to the right hand side of your screen, you'll see there's a box to ask questions. I'm going to be monitoring them throughout and we'll be pausing and I'll be handing your questions to both Deb and Margaret who will be able to clarify any points or questions that you have. Um, at this point, I'm now going to hand across to Margaret to start. Hi everyone, my name is Margaret Ajay, I'm the Programme Director at Locality and today myself and my colleague Deb, who will introduce herself later, will be taking you through the Our Place programme. What we'll try and do as much as possible is tell you as much about the programme and the benefits of actually being part of the Our Place programme. So why the session? It's to introduce you to Our Place and the stages involved. We also want to take you through the shared learning, including Champions Network activities and as Luke said initially we'll sort of create space and opportunity for you to ask, ask as many questions as, as possible and get clarification um, on as many of the questions as you can. The next thing we're going to do now is we're going to do a, a very short poll so if you could actually it should be appearing now so if you could actually respond for us that would be really helpful. The poll is just to get a feel for where people are in their journey and to see where and what we can do as an organization to, to help you along that journey. So if you just take a little, a few minutes, a few seconds to complete that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. It looks like quite a large number of people are, are interested in our place and probably want to sort of find out a bit more. About 54% are interested, about 23% have a project which they feel might be suitable, so they want to find out a bit more about uh, our place today. And I think 20% of you look like you've um, already applied, so that's great. Um, I think that should be it for now. Thank you very much. So we're going to try and go through the, um, the slides and I'm going to pause at certain points um, to allow you to ask as many questions as, as you can. So moving on swiftly then. <clears throat> About our place and what it is. Our place is a collaborative approach used by local communities and public service professionals to transform local services and budgets within their neighborhoods. Our place works on the premise that local people know exactly what they want, they know what services they need, at what time, they've got the resources, the capability and ideas, and they can work with local public service professionals who equally are dynamic and have got huge amounts of understanding of what local people need. So as a partnership, they come together to sort of explore how best to design, co-create, reshape, influence, um, develop services so that it meets the needs of local people. And I think that one of the things that we'll say as well is that it's important that as part of that we look at how local public um, budgets are being used in the process. So the services as well as budgets are then rewired and redesigned around the needs of local people. And that's what our place is about. So, in terms of examples of what our place is, if, for example, you are a local health provider and you are thinking that um, you want to sort of look at how we promote healthier lifestyles and you've got partners locally, be it your local voluntary trusts, organizations, private sector organizations, uh, and community groups who are very keen to actually promote a healthier community, you might want to come together uh, and look at um, 
a service which is of a priority to, to your local area. So for example, diabetes could be something that is quite prominent in your local community and it's something that you want to tackle as a partnership. Um, so you might sort of train some health champions and they could be volunteers so you might want to invest in, in sort of training health champions who go out there working from satellite locations it could be GP surgeries, it could be a local mosque or church offering advice, support and signposting and I think at the end of the day because the services are actually rewired around what local people want and expect and you are working collect collectively using the re existing resources you have what you probably end up achieving over a longer you know, over a period of time, let's say four or five years, is that you might see a, a big difference in, in, in terms of um, what do you call it the cost to, to the local your neighborhood. So you, you might sort of reduce a lot of um, money in, in, to that effect. Similarly, you might want to as an organize, you know as, as, a, as a neighborhood um, want to look at ways in which you could use your budgets differently to commission services. So again, money might be set aside and you as a local community group might be given some funding um, and, and you know encouraged and trained and developed to commission services for, for, for example the elderly. So I think our place for us is very much around the services, looking at ways to actually transform local services, making it better for people. And at the heart of it is local people and what they want, what their priorities and needs are. Now, there are some building blocks for our place. Um, last year, um, we had 12 Our Place pioneers who did some exemplary work. They, they looked at a range of services which affected local people in their neighbourhoods and were supported by public service agencies who were equally very committed to actually seeing services improved. And following the, the pilot initiative, um, we identified some, some building blocks for our place. And if you look at the diagram in front of you under scoping and designing, I've mentioned several times the importance of actually designing services that meet local community needs. So whatever service that is actually that you're thinking of developing, it's important that it's informed by what local people want. So you need to get out there and obviously look at identifying community priorities. <clears throat> and one of the models used by Poplar, for example, is, is community organizing, where they've got people going out into the community and knocking on doors and asking questions as to what people want and expect to see in terms of our place. And, and obviously local people have got huge amounts of knowledge and expertise as well, so the data is critical. And you might want to actually be working with your public service organisations as well to identify what data is critical to help you actually achieve your objective. And the other thing that you need to be thinking very hard about or should have in place is partners. And as I said, your local public service organisations, health organisations, local CCGs, for example, a local authority, parish councils, are all critical partners in the process if our place is to work. Once you've actually got those um, initial bits going, you need to start thinking about, well, what is the problem then that we've got to, to solve? Work through the data, work through the evidence you've got, and together with the partners, explore some solutions, but making sure that the community is right at the heart of it. Um, and you know, you might find communities are willing to volunteer, as I said earlier, and, and obviously provide some resources to make it happen. You've then got to be thinking very carefully about the budgets involved, the resources that you might need, and then also developing a business case. The key thing is finding a solution that works for your local community. It's absolutely critical. And making sure that they're all embedded, all the local people are embedded in planning, deciding, and shaping the service as much as possible. The other thing that you need is very strong leadership clear governance driving the whole process as well and obviously once you've tackled one initiative it makes it a lot easier then to look at other services in your local area so the building blocks are absolutely critical and that's something that when you join the program we will take you through and make sure that you actually follow thoroughly what our place is not unfortunately we cannot use um the grant funding that we've got from DCLG to help you buy and develop local shops, for example, as a meeting place for the community. So it's not about assets, nor is it about country, county-wide or district-wide initiatives. So for example, we might get applications for people wanting to buy IT equipment for volunteers to use. Unfortunately, we cannot support that. Or indeed, hire equipment to run workshops or run the local after-school club. Um, you know, we cannot meet people's running costs, for example, 
or maybe run additional services in the library. As I said, our place is, is bigger than that. It's about what communities want, the partnerships being involved, communities being central to redesigning, rewiring services, and implementing solutions that actually transform local services and local budgets. I'm going to pause here for some questions and answers. So I've been having a look through the questions, Margaret, and I think there's quite a few coming in at the moment. I'll just find a relevant one for you. So I can see here someone has asked, they're saying they need to, I think you might have just covered this, they need to run their services from a, from premises. Are you saying that if that is the case with their project that they cannot apply to join the programme? What we, We're not saying that they cannot apply to join the programme. What we cannot fund or support is, uh, and what we've seen some people asking us is that they want to actually use the grant funding to buy, to, to sort of do some work around buying that particular premises for the services. Um, we have got an advised services team who could probably signpost you to other opportunities, but we cannot give you the funding to, to sort of towards buy the, to buy the premises that you're going to be using. What we are asking you to do is to think about services that local people want that could potentially be delivered in the building. And that something that could be done as part of the, the project but the grant funding and the direct support that we offer which I think Deb is going to go through in detail is not going to help you invest in that property unfortunately. And we have another question from the audience can you give an example of what would make a good or strong application please? What I'd like to do is that I'm, I'm going to leave that question until um, Deb starts um, her presentation because we will sort of go through in detail what a good application would look like but what I'd like to say very briefly is that I'll take you back to the building blocks it's important that the community informs the process that they are in the driving seat that they tell you what they want and need I use the community organizing model as a powerful model to do that it's important you've got the right partnerships and stakeholders in place who are equally committed and passionate about actually making a difference as well you need to be able to sort of work collectively and collaboratively to actually make a change and I think it helps if for example there is some some budget allocated to make this happen and make it a reality. That's all the questions we've had for the moment so I shall hand back to you now for the next part of the presentation. Okay so moving on to the next part of the presentation. We need to go back. No we need to go back. Keep going back. Yeah. So our place, making the differences, sorry, our place and the differences you can make by actually being part of the programme. I think that um, based on what I've said so far, I think where services are influenced, shaped and designed by local citizens, it can only work and be right for them. We all want to see services that are accessible, inclusive and actually making a difference on the ground and our place gives us the opportunity to do exactly that. You may find in your neighbourhood or may learn from other neighbourhoods that they've done some fantastic things that you want to replicate locally. Our place gives you the opportunity to bring that expertise back into your neighbourhood as well. So you might get another neighbourhood working collaboratively with you. I'm not saying that they're coming to do the um, programme for you or the project for you, but they might offer some advice and support to help you implement that initiative. And also the most important thing I'll say as well, it helps us to use our local budgets differently for community benefit um, and give communities greater control over how the budgets are used. The other thing is the long term and sometimes immediate benefits that you get or the savings you get as a result of actually rewiring or reshaping or, or designing services differently. But also notes that we minimise waste and duplication where local people inform the process and tell us what works for them and how effectively services can be delivered locally. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Deb, who is actually going to take you through to the next stage of the process. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Deb Appleby um, and I'm acting as the Programme Manager for the Our Place Programme whilst we get it launched. Um, what I want to do to begin with is just um, launch another poll with you um, to try and find out how far you've gone 
into your um, application process. So I'll launch that and while I'm doing that I'll just make sure that you can see me on the video. Um, so the poll should have been launched now and it's just wanting to know how far through the application process you have gone. It may be that this question isn't one that you can all answer but just those of you that are interested enough to be thinking about making an application would be great. It looks like 34% um, of you have voted, so maybe there's a few more people who are actually in the application process. I'll just give it a few more seconds <coughs> to run. And I'll maybe assume that no one else is going to vote. So let's see the results of that and then I'll tell you a little bit about the um, applications that we've received so far. So roughly two thirds of you have got as far as completing an eligibility checker but have not yet submitted your application. And if I compare that to what we're seeing for the programme as a whole, what we've got um, is a huge interest in the programme actually. 476 people have completed eligibility checkers and two thirds of those are from community organisations, um, which, is, which is really encouraging. Um, of those completed eligibility checkers, 104 applications have been submitted so far. And one of the things that we wanted to discuss in this seminar was really making sure that you are identifying an eligible project because about a third of the applications we've received are really for projects that we can't fund through our place. And some of those are examples that Margaret touched on in her presentation where people are really at the stage of wanting to implement a particular project that's to do with a single service or to do with taking a building into community use. And what our place is actually about is a much more um, joined up look at the way in which services are delivered in an area. The good news is that 11 areas have so far been accepted onto the Our Place programme, so that means that they have submitted the application, we've been able to assess that and make a recommendation to the Department of Communities and Local Government. And the balance of those areas so far is that five are community-led initiatives, four are led by the town or parish council, and two are led by their local authority. And I think when we were discussing with DCLG the likely composition of this, this programme, we had hoped that it would be about 50-50 community-led or public sector-led initiatives. So that, that's an encouraging start for the programme. There's about another 30 applications in the pipeline so far, so um, we'll be able to update that result later. I then wanted to move on to talk about the development strategy and what it is that we're expecting from you in the first phase. So you can make your application any time now and we really want those applications to be received by the end of February. If your application is successful then you'll be offered um, a small getting started grant of about £3,000 and about half of the groups that we accept on the programme will also be able to access a relationship manager or some consultancy support right from the start. In exchange for that support what we want you to do by the 9th of May is to produce a development strategy and I'll show you in the next slide what that development strategy needs to cover. I've divided the development strategy into two components. Um, on the left hand side you can see that it's things that I've called an update. So these are um, items about your area and the project that you're proposing to undertake.
that you've already told us about in your application form. And what we want to do, um, want to see in the development strategy is how this has moved on. So the first thing that you'll have told, me, told us about is the area that you propose as the R-case area and the difference that you hope to be able to make as a result of undertaking the R-place approach. A good area will be one that covers a, a fairly well-defined geography. People who live there will naturally say that that's where they live when you ask them what community they belong to. Um, and sometimes that area will be bounded by some kind of natural or man-made boundary like a river, um, a major road, something that that makes a clear division between that area and the next neighbourhood or community. Well, I've also asked you in, in your initial application what difference it is you want to make, what the themes are, what the potential beneficiaries are, um, and, and what will be different as a result of taking part in our place. And we expect you to refine those ideas during the first three month period. So in the development strategy, you will have narrowed down the scope and in some cases um, for the pioneers they found that the thing they wanted to change was actually quite different to their original um, hypothesis or theory of change because as they dug deeper into the evidence they discovered that some different service or factor will make a bigger difference. Um, many of the good applications that we're seeing have started with um, an understanding of what the community thought was important. But if you don't have that engagement so far, that's something that you need to build up in the first three months. And it may be that that needs to carry on throughout the whole 15 month period in order to really ensure that the, the solution, the r place approach that you adopt at the end of the period um, will be used and accepted within the community. In your original application, we'll also have asked you who your main partners are um, and the level of their commitment to the programme. By the time that you complete and submit your development strategy, that buy-in needs to be well established and you need to know who the partners are that will commit to the next stage of the programme. And then in the final part of updates, we'll simply be asking you what you've achieved so far using the grant and the direct support that we've made available. The rest of the development strategy will be a sort of 10 to 12 page document outlining each of the items here. So how will you manage your transition from the development strategy through to a full operational plan? What can you tell us about the emerging business case and cost benefit analysis for the changes you're proposing to make? How will these new services be governed? Um, and we know for example, that some organisations will be working together to create a new delivery organisation or to devolve budgets to a different tier of local government or even to a community-led organisation. We'll ask you what your timetable is, um, and not just when you expect to complete your operational plan, but also when you would expect to be able to implement the changes that you're thinking you would make. How will you put together the money to develop this operational plan and perhaps test the changes and make any, any supporting changes and what is it that you're asking from us as you go through this development stage. And the final component of the development strategy is that it should have that evidence of partner buy-in by having it signed off at a senior level from the key partners. Just going to talk briefly now about the support programme and then I'll pause for some questions. So I've already mentioned the getting started phase with the small grants and an element of direct support in year one. Those groups, and we expect there to be up to 120 of them, who go forward to the full programme, will receive um, grants in two stages. There'll be a, a £10,000 grant to use for um, however you wish to getting the program through the development strategy into an operational plan and for those of you that are perhaps doing something slightly more unusual grants between five and seven and a half thousand pounds to help you to get that more detailed analysis for example to facilitate some some detailed learning 
up or questionnaire um, among potential service users to do the cost benefit analysis and so forth. And for a very small number of projects, perhaps 20 at most, that five to seven and a half thousand could extend to a maximum of 20,000 pounds for projects that are preparing to break from the ground. And then just to talk briefly about the direct support that becomes available to all groups um, who go forward to the second phase of the programme and, and are trying to turn their development strategy into an operational plan. Um, for each of those areas, we will offer you a relationship manager um, who will be able to spend about four and a half days with you over the remainder of the programme period and some consultancy or coaching support tailored to meet your needs. Both the relationship managers and the consultants come from the various partners who are working with us on the programme. So in addition to locality and the various associates that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, we're also working with the local government association, with the Office for Public Management, with the Young Foundation, and then in terms of financial analysis and, and sort of economic modelling, both Manchester New Economy and Pro Bono Economics. We have other partners who are Social Enterprise UK, Community Matters, NELC, and finally Anthony Collins, who will be helping specifically with some legal seminars and if you have particular governance issues that you need to overcome. Both of those, the, the, the focus of the relationship manager and the um, nature of the consultancy support will be dependent upon what you say to us in the delivery strategy would be most helpful. And just to recap, in terms of the getting started phase, about half of the groups that we support at phase one will access the relationship manager or some consultancy support at an early stage. So what I want to do now is just pause again and see if there are any questions. So I can see lots of people in the audience are asking questions and I've made a note of a, note of a few here, Deb. So Matthew is asking, with the Our Place process, what's more important, cost saving or involving the community? Well, I think they're not mutually exclusive. Um, the, the backdrop of cost saving like is the financial position that all of our public services face at the moment. The, the hard truth is that there is not the money to develop new ways of doing things in addition to the existing ways of doing things. So when we've been talking to groups over the last few years about community rights, what we've tended to talk about is service ideas which deliver better for less. So that, that's your financial component of it. The community engagement goes back to what Margaret was saying right at the start. Um, it, it's a, a philosophy that all of the partners within the Our Place programme share, that communities are best placed to know the solutions to their own problems. And there is no point running a service that doesn't meet the need. So a well-targeted service, taking full account of how the community thinks those issues can be addressed, is likely to deliver you better value for money um, and, and there will be this constant need within the our place process to think about if you want to start something new what could you stop in order to fund that new thing so i hope that answers your question matthew and i can also see lucy is asking does the project need to involve a devolved public sector budget and she adds that their project involves a partnership of vcs service survive service providers supporting public sector services? Okay, well, there's a, a principle really that has come in, um, well, not just with the, the, the current government, it was, it was there before, that um, funding decisions should be made as close as possible to the community. So an element of our place could be the decision by a variety of public sector Providers either to pool budgets and have a single lead provider making decisions about the budget um, and that pers that organisation could be at a more local level than the existing decisions are being made at. So, so devolution can be a part of the budget um, 
element of our place, but it doesn't have to be. So um, I'm not entirely sure what total project Lucy's got in mind, but it wouldn't exclude it if, if there wasn't then a decision to um, devolve a budget. Although it may well be that one of the service providers would commission that group of voluntary sector organisations to provide services, and in that sense, the voluntary sector groups would be making the service decisions themselves. And I've got one more quick question for Robert. Robert's asking, can this be used in conjunction with the community right to bid? Um, it, it's possible that um, a community group may be using more than one element of localism at the same time. Um, I, I think our place is most likely to succeed if the asset transfer has already taken place or if, if the community already knows that the building is going to come into its control, whereas um, typically you would be triggering a moratorium under the community right to bid or applying to SIB for funding under the Community Ownership of Assets programme at an earlier stage and wouldn't necessarily have that ability to determine um, what the future use of the building would be. So I'd say it's possible, but unlikely. And I can see there's lots more questions coming in, but if we pause slightly later on at the end for some more questions, and we'll continue with the presentation now. Yeah, certainly. Thanks very much, Luke. So I just want to move on and talk a little bit about what happens during the rest of the programme. And this might um, help to what, for those of you that are trying to work out whether your project idea would fit. Um, just briefly to, to touch on the key dates, I've already talked about the 9th of May being the deadline for submitting a development strategy in the R Place programme. Um, and those development strategies will be used as the basis for selecting a maximum of 120 groups who can progress onto the second phase of the R Place programme and would access these larger grants and, and the relationship management and consultancy support that goes with it. The middle phase of the programme is about putting together your draft operational plan and essentially you've got six months to do this. So the draft operational plan needs to be completed and submitted to us and ready for peer challenge by at least two other our place areas by the end of November. We then enter a period of, of modification of those plans. Um, we're expecting in the period until just after Christmas that peer challenge will take place and by the 12th of January each area will have had some helpful feedback not just from the our place team but also from other areas grappling hopefully with quite similar issues. You then have about six weeks again to work back in, in your group on finalising that operational plan so that it can be submitted through locality to the Department for Communities and Local Government for signing. The other point I just wanted to draw out at this stage is that there is a fast track option for up to 10 areas who maybe feel they've been working on our place for a long time already and would be able to submit a development strategy to us very quickly, much faster than the 9th of May. And having done that, would potentially be able to access the year two grants from as early as April, rather than waiting until the end of May or into June. Um, there are two applications that we've already assessed that are on this basis, and there's one waiting for assessment at the moment. So. So we would expect most of those fast track um, opportunities to be allocated very quickly. Moving on again then, if I can just talk a little bit about the conversion of the development strategy to an operational plan. Say so we're, we're trying to encourage areas to stretch themselves um, and get to a point within 15 months where they can potentially not just know what they want to change, but be in a position and have the sign up of all the other agencies to make those changes. However, we recognise that budget cycles and a variety of other things, including, I know, um, 
local elections in some of the potential R place areas will affect the sign off for some of these changes um, and for many of us will be affected by the new three year funding cycle and may or may not be able to implement these until <coughs> new funding arrangements are in place. So we're encouraging groups to be ambitious, to push the boundaries and to break new ground and, and the main um, difference between those two things in my mind is that if you're pushing boundaries you are doing something that has not been done um, in the area where you were based before. If you're breaking new ground potentially you're doing something that hasn't been done anywhere in England until now or if it has there isn't much knowledge about the impact that it will have or the difference that it can make. So there's a sort of whole scale of of change that will partly be determined on the history of partnership working and initiatives that have been tried in your particular area, but also will depend on how easily you're able to learn from and influence change elsewhere. If I just quickly show a couple of slides about the content of the operational plan, and I've, I've, done, I've tried to do this in the same way as I presented the development strategy. So there are various things that within your operational plan you will be finalising. You'll be very clear about the area and the vision, although we know that in some places what you want to do is trial something in one area but for a wider rollout across a district or county area. You'll need to finalise your focus and outcomes and probably to have got that signed off um, at board or management level within various of the key partners. You'll need to have really finalised your community engagement and shown why this solution will have the support of the community. So you need to know what your partners buy in and you'll also need to keep telling us what you've been able to achieve. Turning to the implementation element of this, we'll be asking you to define in as much detail as you can the changes to both service delivery and budgets that you're going to make, how that new service model will be governed and how it will be accountable to the community, recognising that most of the resources you'll be using will be from the public purse. Be interested to know what leverage you're able to make of resources from elsewhere and that could be through um, voluntary income. Um, subscriptions that service users are willing to make or business sponsorship and as ever the senior sign-off remains absolutely key. You'll also be needing to spell out more information about those changes to be made and it doesn't necessarily have to include all of these elements because it does very much depend on the issue you're trying to address and the solution that emerges as the most appropriate for your area. But we would expect at least some of these to be part of your final operational plan. So a summary of the way in which services are to be redesigned, our new services introduced, and as I said earlier, that will need to be complemented by a sense of which services are to be decommissioned. Um, information about who's going to deliver those services, including the fact that they might now be delivered from the community. The business case that justifies that change and the cost benefit analysis that you've been able to undertake. The point I touched on earlier about um, there being a greater community influence on spending and that could include delegated or devolved budgets and the operational structure that you're going to adopt. So if I pause again now for some questions um, and let Luke tell me what you've all been asking. So I can see we're getting a few more questions through and Matthew's asking, will relationship managers come from locality, CLG or other partners? Okay, the expectation is that relationship managers will primarily be drawn from locality and from the pool of associates that we work with on a regular basis. Um, what we want to do is work with people that we're already used to working with and who we know have a strong track record in enabling this sort of multi-agency change. Um, Matthew and probably the others will be aware that, that 
CLG themselves taking a great interest in some of the areas and may well choose to take an active involvement in, in what's going on in an area, although they won't be relationship managers as such. And in that sense, there's quite a key difference between this program and the um, pioneers who, who all forged that direct relationship with CLG. And I've got one more question from William, who's asking, can you tell us more about the fast track route? The initial guidance indicates that some areas would be expected to produce a development strategy by the 4th of March. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right, William. We, we were asking for fast trackers to be committed to producing a development strategy by the 10th of March. That is hugely demanding, um, not least because the way in which applications are coming in, there's a fair chance that groups won't actually know whether they've been accepted onto the program until the 10th of March. Um, but we will be contacting groups as and when they apply to talk them through the requirements of the development strategy and check that fast track is really appropriate for them. Um, it is really designed for those situations where a lot of work has already been done and as I said earlier a development strategy would really be a case of no more than conversion of work that's already been done into the template that we're proposing for our development strategy. The, if, if you go through the fast track route um, funding support would be available from um, about the 7th of April and the expectation would be that the draft operational plan was submitted to us by the end of October with a view to peer review and, and finalisation taking place during November and December. And I've got one final question here from Ivan who's asking, is it possible to set up a programme for a new community? Depends what you mean by a new community. If, if, if it's, um, for example, a, um, a new estate that's being created in a place, I, I think a key element of that will be about how well um, residents can be brought together at an early stage. Um, a new community can still be emerging in my experience five to ten years after um, the, the housing that they all lived in has, has been um, appointed. But the, the, the key to think about here is that what the community has to have in common is something to do with the geographic location. Um, if, if you mean new communities in the sense of recently migrated communities, it, it, it probably would be worth us talking outside of this webinar, but, but it's not really what the programme is targeted towards. So thanks for picking up on those few questions. Deborah, I shall hand back to you again. Okay, well, I've finished what I was going to say about the actual delivery of the programme, so I'm going to hand back to Margaret, who's just going to talk a little bit about the learning resources and the Champions Network that support the programme. Thank okay, you. I'll hand back over to you now, Margaret. Thank you, Luke and Deb. <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk you through the shared learning opportunities under our place and what I want to make very clear at the beginning is that all our shared learning opportunities are open to people on the program and those who are interested but do not or are not very keen to apply to join the program or anyone interested in using our place approach locally and wants to know as much as possible about what our place is about wants to learn from others on the program and some from some of our pioneers as well so one of the things that we are creating very shortly, and it will be launched on the 10th of March at the Local Government Association offices in London, is the Champions Network. The Champions Network is an inspirational network full of leaders, experts, people who are committed and passionate about our place. They can come from the community sector, voluntary based sector, private sector, local government, who are willing to give us a little bit of time to support, to coach, to advise, maybe contribute to events, case studies, shared learning opportunities, peer mentoring. Um, so we're launching that network. We're looking for 100 inspired or inspirational people who will join the network and support our efforts to create a movement, i.e. in our place movement. What I'll do later on is show you a slide 
um, which sort of gives you further information about the event. The Knowledge Hub is another area that we'll be using quite actively where people can share learning, post information, ask questions, seek mentoring, seek advice as well, upload really you know, relevant documents that people can have a look at. We're hoping that through the, you know, the, the Champions Network and the Pioneers, we can set up peer groups so that an area can feed into peer groups and seek advice again and share some learning with other people, ask questions. And what we'll try and do as much as possible is to get some of our relationship managers to be involved in some of the peer group activities. If you go on our website, and I'll give you the link at the end of this, you'd find um, the Startup app, which is the first of the many that we are hoping to produce, and how to guides. Um, there are some that are already produced by the pioneers on community engagement, top 10 tips, that sort of thing. So there's lots of very useful information on the website for, for people who are thinking about our place, as I said, or people who just want to use the approach locally, and others who want to get involved in the program. We're running a series of learning events. Um, we'll be advertising very soon um, some cost-benefit analysis sessions as well. Um, and in June, we're running two events, one in the south and in the north. Um, that will be followed by further events in um, November and another one in January as well. And all the dates will be available on our website. Um, in addition to this webinar, we're hoping to run a couple more. So if you do email us at our place um, at locality.org.uk, tell us what other webinars would help you. But the next one we'd like to focus on is on cost benefit analysis. Our monthly newsletter comes out at the end of each month. Our next one is due out very shortly. We'll be coaching and mentoring. And the other thing we'd like to do as well is off, you know, run a, a series of case studies on our website. There's two excellent ones online at the moment, one from Castleville and another one from One Ilfacum. Um, and it'll, you know, we've got Castleville, um, they've, they've produced a short film as well, which is very useful for people who are starting up, want to know more about our place, want to know the key ingredients for success, want to find out how they did it and what they did, in addition to all the learning from the pioneers. We're hoping that we can implement a time bank model whereby, you know, you can get a bit of time from one area um, and, and, you know, obviously they volunteer a bit of time to help you get started more or less. Further information on our website shortly. And the thing we'll be doing as well towards November, early part of next year is publishing strategies and plans. So you can see the sort of things that all the different projects are getting involved in. So if you are interested in using our place, you can go online, have a look at what people are doing. You can then obviously ask questions of the other areas who are involved in it. So as I said earlier on, we'll be launching the Our Place program and the Champions Network, we're launching the program in the sense that we want to celebrate the fact that we've been able to sort of um, implement the program and it's up and running and use the opportunity to obviously um, tell you more about the Champions Network and get in people who are interested in joining the network, hopefully to sign up. Um, the event will be chaired by Councillor Ron, um, Ron Lay, who is the chair of the Our Place Champions Network and one of the Our Place pioneers. And our keynote speakers include uh, Councillor Sir Merrick Cockle um, and Stephen Williams, MP, uh, Minister for Communities as well. The event is free and we will send you a copy of the slides shortly so that you can actually um, select a link um, and apply to sort of um, attend the event. Um, similarly, you can go onto the local government association website um, and sort of click in the event section and register to attend the event. Um, it's a fun-filled day. We'll tell you a little bit more about the programs. We'll hear from the pioneers. We'll hear from some of the experts. We'll have run workshops on community organising, on cost-benefit analysis, and on community co-creation, co-design, more or less. So. If you are interested, know of other people who are interested in becoming involved, want to use our place approach, want to find out what it's all about, um, the 10th of March is the day that you can actually learn a bit more and, and meet some of the experts and talk to them. So I'm going to sort of carry out our final poll, um, which is now shown on your screen. And if you can take a few minutes to have a, you know, contribute to that, that would be really helpful. Thank you. It looks like half of you would be submitting an application. 
Um, a few more people need more information before deciding to apply. Um, what I'll say is that we've got our Community Rights Advice Services team who are on standby between 9.30 and 12.30, uh, Monday to Friday, who can obviously give you some advice and I'll show you the advice line number. Similarly, you can email our place at locality.org.uk um, and one of us, Deb or myself or one of the our place team can come back to you and talk to you further. So if you do want further information, please do contact us and we'll be more than happy to provide as much information as possible. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pause here for a few more questions. I can see we've had one more question, Margaret. I'm just going to take a look at that now. William's asking, when will the guidance for perform? Oh, sorry, when will the guidance performer for the development strategy be published? It'll be up in the next couple of weeks. Deb is finalising that, um, and so that will be on the website shortly, and we'll make sure that all the expressions of interest and all applicants get copies as soon as it, it comes out. But as Deb has outlined, those are the key things that we'll actually be asking for. Um, you know, hopefully by next week we should have um, a near finished template, and then it'll be out, as I said, in the next couple of weeks formally. And it will be published on our website as well, so you can download it from the website. And I've got one final question here from Chris. He says, how soon will we hear if our applications have been successful? Um, we are assessing applications as we speak now. So in the again, in the next few days, we will be coming back to people who've applied. Um, please note that all decisions that are made are obviously going to to go to a panel and then obviously to our, um, the Department for Communities and Local Government as well for final sign-off. So we're working very, very quickly to get make sure that people hear from us in the next few days. And that's all the questions we've had through for the moment, Margaret. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show a few um, things on our, some of the resources and further information that is available to help people. I've gone through some of them already, but if you visit our website under mycommunityrights.org.uk, our place, you can get a copy of the starter pack. As I said, the film from um, Castle Vale, which is absolutely brilliant. For those of you who are thinking of applying or are not sure or still need further information before deciding, frequently asked questions, which is updated regularly. Um, learning from the, you know, the, the pilots we've talked about, the 12 pioneers. Uh, and what they achieved, and as I said earlier on, some fantastic guides that have been produced by the pioneers on community engagement, partner engagement, governance and cost-benefit analysis, and the top 10 tips for success as well. So there's a lot, huge amount of information on the website that you can have a look at before applying. But please know that we, we are hoping to have, you know, released most of the funding by end of February. So if you're thinking of applying, please do so now. Who's around to help you? I've mentioned the My Community Rights um, advice line. Um, you can now see the Get Advice information. If Once we send the slides to you, if you click on there and send us um, a message or a question, we can respond. Similarly, you can email us at our place at locality.org.uk. You've heard from Deb, you've heard from myself. We've got two other colleagues, Nicola Berry and Ricky Mitchell, who will be happy to assist as well. We are here to make sure that you, we give you the information you need to apply. So, you know, as I said, email, contact us, and we'll do as much as possible to get you started. Well, what I'd like to say is a big thank you, very, thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, you know, we're, we're waiting to get your applications, and we'll respond as quickly as possible to the ones that we've got in the next couple of days. I'm now going to hand over to Luke. So, thank you, everyone who has attended. I hope that gives you a little bit more information about our place and how to get started. Um, before I close. The session i'd just like to let you all know that on the 26th of february we are running another free webinar that's around community buying and chris pomfret will be speaking on that so if that's something that interests you if you'd like to know more about that you can visit www.locality.org.uk forward slash event and there's a link there where you can sign up and i hope to all see you next time have a good afternoon goodbye